Dearly beloved, today we celebrate the second Sunday after Easter. This Sunday is also known as Good Shepherd Sunday because of the theme which runs through the Epistle and Gospel reading for today's Mass. The image of Christ as the Good Shepherd was a favorite image among the early Christians. And one of the earliest Christian paintings, which is found in the catacombs of Rome, is an image of Christ as the Good Shepherd. Each of us, if we look, and most of us have seen an image of, the, of Christ as a Good Shepherd, who would not be touched by that image so tender, holding a lamb on his shoulders. The lamb is all of us. But why was this image so impressed upon the minds and the hearts of the early Christians? Well, to begin with, the image of the shepherd was one, a well-known image to the Jewish people. Not only were shepherds and flocks of sheep found copiously throughout the land of Israel, but God himself had portrayed himself many times in Holy Scripture as the shepherd of Israel. For example, in Psalm 23, God tells his people, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. However, besides reminding the faithful that God is our good shepherd, there is another reason that this image is presented to us during this Easter time. This is the fact that during this Easter season, God, through his church, wishes to continue to strengthen the faith of the newly baptized and all of us as well. That is, that the risen Christ has come to fulfill all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, and this included the prophecy of the Good Shepherd as well. Indeed, our Lord declared to the Pharisees when they accused him of changing God's laws, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. The prophecy of the Good Shepherd is found in chapter 35 of the prophet Ezekiel. Here the prophet declares concerning the future Good Shepherd that he will visit his sheep and deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And he will feed them in the most fruitful pastures. He will seek that which was lost and that which was driven away he will bring again. He will bind up that which was broken and strengthen that which is weak. And finally, he will set up one shepherd over them. One can only imagine that if Christ had been given the book of Ezekiel to read instead of that of the prophet Isaiah when he entered the synagogue during the beginning of his public ministry, his words to the priests and scribes would have been the same. He would have said to them, On this day it is fulfilled the scripture in your ears. Beloved, our risen Savior is indeed our good shepherd. He has sought out and found his rational sheep who were once lost. Those sheep are we, the people of his divine leading. Yes, he has bound up our wounds, our sins, through the shedding of his precious blood. He has led us to the fruitful pastures of grace, holiness, and the sacraments, which have as their ultimate fulfillment in the eternal pastures of heavenly beatitude. But even in our Easter joy, each one of us, the sheep, must ask himself, herself, with complete honesty, am I one of Christ's sheep? 
How can I really know what characteristics the Christ sheep have? In the parable of the Good Shepherd, which St. John gives us, <coughs> Christ gives us two main characteristics which identify his sheep. The first is that they know him. According to St. Gregory, in homily this day, this knowledge of Christ the Good Shepherd is not a knowledge of, through faith, but a knowledge through love. This is attested to by Christ himself when he says in the Gospels, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And again, if you love me, keep my commandments. According to St. Cyril of Alexandria, this knowledge of Christ as a good shepherd also implies a relationship with him. And this relationship is not built on superficial emotions, but one that results from a participation of honor and grace. This too is attested to by Christ himself, in a manner of speaking, when to those who may have cried out, Lord, Lord, without true contrition and belonging to him, he declares to them, I never knew you. Thus, refreshed with the Easter sacraments, we must examine ourselves and consider within ourselves if we have remained in the love of our Good Shepherd and truly continue to be risen with Christ. Or have we been led astray again through sin and led back again to the love of the world and its pleasures? The second characteristic Christ's sheep is that they hear his voice and they follow him. In the Invitatory Antiphon, which forms part of the night office, which the clergy are bound to pray every day, the following words were sung during the last two weeks of Lent. If today you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts. The voice of our Good Shepherd is manifested to all of us every day in a variety of ways. For example, it can be, word, it can be heard in the words of the Holy Liturgy and in Holy Scripture, or in the lawful, lawful, and legitimate words of the Church and her ministers and superiors, in the voice of parents. In the variety of people the Lord uses on a daily basis to give us his providential care, which mysteriously leads us and guides us in our daily lives. But we must be honest and reflect on how many times each day we are blessed in hearing this divine voice, so subtle but real. I always tell children, and talking with them and preparing for their sacraments. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just see Jesus every time you look at your mother and dad and they're asking you for something? And they always look at me with bright eyes and say, yes, yes, we would all love that. <coughs> but our Lord works in a hidden manner to increase our faith. Do we listen to his divine voice daily? And, if no less more importantly, do we follow it? One last thing concerning our Lord and the Good Shepherd, which I know the faithful are very concerned about today especially, is it will be its connection to the pastors of the church. In homily is given for this day, I think there are a couple of points that are given by the fathers today that can help us in our struggles, at least in some respect. The first thing is that St. Gregory tells us today that we can only recognize a true shepherd from a hireling during times of trial. He says that it is only when a wolf comes around 
that each shepherd shows the purpose for which he has been standing guard over his flock. That is, as he's standing as a shepherd, that stays, or as he a hireling that flees. And another, another principle is given by St. John Chrysostom. He tells us that when he, they, sought to, they sought to kill Christ, that our Lord neither withdrew his teaching, he didn't back down about his teaching in the least, nor did he betray those who believed in him, but he stood, he stood firm and chose to die. So here we have two principles which we should pray for, especially for all priests in the hierarchy, that, yes, they be good shepherds, that they stand firm in the teachings of the church, so much so that as they know on the ordination day, <coughs> priests wear black for a reason, to die to self, be ready to give their lives for their flocks, however great they may be, even if it was only one faithful. Cardinals, of course, wear red to remind them of the same thing, and bishops, fuchsia, for the same reason, that they are to give their life for their flocks, that is, the church, if the Lord requires it. And this could be, yes, in their life of blood, which has happened, as we know, to many saints, pastors of the church in past times, even up to our current days, especially in the suffering countries of persecution. But there also could be not just a blood martyrdom, but the white martyrdom of being hated, even by a brother priest, for standing up for the truth. We all know, even the faithful know, it's not easy to battle for our faith in the world. You will be disliked, you will be looked down upon, you will be made fun of. But didn't our Lord tell us, blessed are you when people hate you, calumniate you, all because of me, blessed, because your reward will be great in heaven, not in this world. St. Augustine, in dealing with the Donatist heresy of his time, told his faithful as a bishop, as a bishop, when they wondered about listening or not listening to this or that, coming from the hierarchy at different times. This is a principle which you must keep in mind, must be followed, but you must understand what it means. He said, what is being asked? And then he told his, his flock to consider our Lord's words to the Pharisees, about the Pharisees. He said, the Pharisees sit on the chair of Moses, therefore do as they say, that is, uphold legitimate authority and law which is given by God, which they are the, which they are the instruments of. But he said to them, do not do as they do. Which means, when they don't uphold the faith, you are not required to follow that, nor should you. So, we must pray that all pastors, right, all priests, all the hierarchy, uphold the faith, even with their lifeblood, if God required it. But also, be, but also pray that they be white martyrs, be hated by everyone. For what reason? To uphold the truth of Christ, because that's all that matters, and that is why they were ordained the priest, to become a pastor, to lead the flock to green pastures, which is, has, has its ultimate end, heaven. 
In other words, St. Augustine, according to his principle, we must listen to legitimate shepherds when their teaching is sound, truthful. But we should not follow after their bad example when they do actions contrary to this teaching. Let us pray for the shepherds of the church, all shepherds, including the canons, that we may lay down our lives if God wishes us to do so. Now, beloved, if we exhibit both of the characteristics in the parable of the Good Shepherd, that is, we love our Good Shepherd and we listen to Him and follow Him, we will truly be blessed indeed. The Lord ends His parable of the Good Shepherd, which should help us, these words should help motivate all of our actions. He says, I will give them life everlasting. That's all that matters. We want to get to heaven. And it is our good shepherd that leads us there. During this joyful Easter tide, beloved, we have been all refreshed with the Easter sacraments. And God, grant it be so, we have been more deeply converted, as St. Peter says in today's epistle, to the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. May this image of the Lord as the Good Shepherd be impressed ever more, ever more deeply in our minds, hearts, and souls, and thus be made more attentive and obedient to His daily sounds in our ears. May our Blessed Mother, she who kept all the words of our Lord, her Good Shepherd, and pondered them always, at every minute, in your immaculate heart, she followed our Good Shepherd wherever he went. May she continue to lead us to the pastures of God in glory, and this beloved, on to the ages of ages. Please rise and pray.